Hello, ghosties. I'm Chance Lee. And I'm Amanda McAvoy. And this is That's So Gothic, a movie podcast about girls, guys, and haunted houses. And you know, Amanda, I think today's movie is almost as scary as it would be to be stuck on a cruise ship when the toilets won't flush. (laughs) It's Ghost Ship. Murphy. I'm Jack Farrington. I fly the Arctic Weather Patrol. Last month, I was out in the middle of the strait when I came across this. Congratulations. You found a boat in the middle of the ocean. What do you think a ship like this could be worth? Depends on if we have the right to salvage it. I do know one thing. Sea gives you an opportunity to take it. Yo, Murph, I think you should get up here. It's an ocean liner. It's the Antonio Grasa. Any sign of what might have happened? Nothing. No passengers. No crew. No captain. No mention of anything in the ship's log. What do you make of that? The cruise ship. I think I saw something I couldn't possibly have seen. I think I saw a little girl. This isn't real. We're all trapped here. I want to show you something. I told you guys earlier that there was something seriously wrong with this boat. Haunted, possessed, whatever you want to call it. I said we get our boat going and get the hell out of here. We have got to get off this boat now. Bon voyage. I love thinking about a poop cruise. Oh my God. When the beginning of COVID, when all those people were stuck on the (gasps) coast, I just thought that's the worst fate of all time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways. (laughs) Anyways. <laughs> Released in 2002, Ghost Ship was directed by Steve Beck with a script from Mark Hanlon and John Pogue. It stars Juliana Margulies as mm-hmm. Maureen Epps, the member of a salvage crew, Gabriel Byrne as Sean Murphy, their captain, Desmond Harrington as Ferryman, a man with a mission, Emily Browning as a ghost girl and (laughs) Carl Urban and Isaiah Washington as other crew members. And this is the story of a salvage crew looking for treasure on a haunted ship. Yeah. Pretty simple. Easy (laughs) elevator pitch. Yes. The title tells you everything you need to know. And this movie earned $68 million internationally against a budget of 20 million. So not bad. It has a 15% critical tomato (laughs) and a 37% audience tomato. Wow. I actually think the audience tomato is, is higher than I would have expected. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't, I think it doesn't really have a good reputation. We'll get into Mm -hmm. later. The only reason I think people still think about it. Oh yeah. (laughs) Roger Roger Ebert gave it two stars, but weirdly didn't drag it in his review he actually didn't say much bad about it in the written review he said that it's better than you expect but not as good as you hope um yeah i thought that was pretty spot on and i I really liked i really liked this line he said under the time honored code of horror movies the cast will disappear in horrible ways in inverse proportion to their billing (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's it's very true. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. So um, this is the third movie by Dark Castle. 
and the second directed by Steve Beck, who did 13 mm -hmm. Ghosts. Mm -hmm. He says that the script changed significantly from when the actors signed on to when they began filming it. That is, I would assume, a pretty short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> yes i don't so know he that said much it about was... filmmaking but <laughs> yeah he said the producers changed it they it, it started originally as more of a psychological horror mm. and they decided they wanted a more gory horror movie and he said it was originally more like ambiguous and that since this was post 9 11 they wanted a more clear-cut black and white good versus evil story that is incredibly interesting and i think just a really good you know telling of the state of the world the state of america after 9 11 is like there was no ambiguity it was mm -hmm. it was red white and blue baby it was those <laughs> There were separation. <laughs> yeah, eating freedom fries so on true. the deck of the ghost ship. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so true. Yeah. Oh my goodness. He, wow. Interesting. I know. I was surprised. He allegedly, according to Wikipedia, he says that on the director's commentary, but that hmm. commentary is only on the 2020 uh, collector's edition Blu ray re release. They got him to oh. record a commentary. So now I have to find that. Honestly wow i want that <laughs> it has a really cool cover but it's a bummer that it doesn't have a lenticular cover because the original <gasps> dvd has the lenticular cover like oh. like the 90s jack frost movie yeah where it's like you know looks normal and then goes creepy evil it has like a skull and, <laughs> yeah. and it says see evil s-e-a see evil <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's no. so good. <laughs> that is so good. I didn't oh, dig I enough that. to see if they at least included an insert with the yeah. with the TV. I don't want to spend thirty dollars on a four K yeah. Ultra HD Blu Ray if it doesn't have a corny lenticular cover. Yeah, and like a terrible pun. This is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so, had you seen this movie before? Yeah, but I think the first time I watched it was not that long. I, I think this could have been a movie that I watched, I don't know, a couple of years ago. I, I had definitely seen it before we talked about doing it for the podcast. Um, I can tell you that I definitely didn't see it as long ago as I saw something like 13 Ghosts. Because mm -hmm. I think 13 Ghosts has a real, you know, sentimental, like sentimental spot in my heart. This movie does not. I did not feel like all oh, no like warm, warm fuzzies for ghost no warm ship. fuzzies for ghost ship. So I can tell you it was not that long ago. I had never seen it. Mm. I had seen the cover because I was working at an FYE when this came out on DVD. <laughs> and I remember us all being like, ooh, over the cover. Yeah. And putting, I don't know if FYE still does this. I haven't been in an FYE in a long time, but we used yeah. to have to put little sale stickers on every single item yeah and so i remember stickering all the ghost ship blu-rays <laughs> yes yeah and out uh to me a lot and so yeah this was still in my i'm scared of horror movies phase mm. i don't want to see them they're gonna upset me and i've been curious to watch it for a long time though just to kind of catch up on what i missed when i was a a pansy yeah <laughs> yeah 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 interesting I watched this on Canopy, the library movie streaming app. Ooh, I might have watched it on there too. I honestly can't remember how I watched it. Uh, watched it this time. I thought I had it on DVD. I think I had told you this. I thought I had purchased a two pack um, when I bought Thirteen Ghosts. I knew that it came with another DVD. I had just assumed it was Ghost Ship. It was actually right. House of Wax. Okay, that is an upgrade. Yeah, I think honestly, in my mind I love House of Wax and I was I hadn't planned on watching it and then I watched it this was you know months ago when I bought it um but apparently I just forgot that it was House of Wax with 13 Ghosts and I just assumed it was um you know see evil <laughs> see evil would be the more apt 
because they're yes. directed by the same guy. They came right. out within like a year of each yeah, other. Yeah, that's why I, I, I think I just assumed and it's not. So I must have watched it on Canopy um, when I watched it recently because I, I can't imagine I would have rented it or anything. <laughs> well, if any of the listeners aren't aware of Canopy, it's a streaming service you can get through some public libraries they give you a set number of tickets per month and you spend your tickets on movies 95 percent of movies cost two tickets and you get three days to watch them ghost ship costs four (laughs) tickets double hot hot commodity (laughs) premium you're paying a premium for ghost ship and you only get two days to watch it like they're like you know what? You got to watch Ghost Ship now. Like you got to sit down. High demand. Focus up. I when I I clicked on it and I was like, I've got to watch this. I can't. Yeah. I cannot afford to spend another four tickets if I don't I finish it in two days. <laughs> like, I gotta finish it. That's a lot. I only get like twelve. Yeah. Like that's more than half my tickets to watch Ghost Ship twice. Right. Oh my goodness. I would love to know about the canopy economics. Actually, I do i don't want to sell myself out too much but i do think that there is a way that libraries can look at the back end of um canopy statistics so Mm. if someone out there i don't believe i have access to that anymore but if someone out there has access to that please let us know what how how much does your library listen how how many patrons have watched ghost ship on your canopy dime I think I I do have access to that, but my mm. library literally just started watch uh, started. Oh. I just started watching Ghost Ship. We just started. <laughs> <laughs> we just started with Canopy a couple months ago. Oh, so, okay. Like, the only one watching Ghost Ship would be me. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool. Again, I don't want to sell myself out too much, but it's not like it wasn't part of my job. Um, there's some really cool features with that. Real quick side note: um, I actually was looking at the uh, data for Midsummer. That's a movie Ooh. on Canopy, if you haven't seen it. They have a lot Great of A24 choice. movies. Um, and you can actually see, like, how many people have watched the movie. And then there's, like, this little line graph. And you can see, like, how what the average time that people watch the movie. And so you'll see, and there's this huge dip at one particular point where people stopped watching the movie. And I would look at it, and it was the scene with the... Um, the cliff is what I'll say. <gasps> That's what I was going to ask. I was yes. going to guess. Yeah. yeah. It's <gasps> so funny. Yeah. It's so, so, so funny. Um, so yeah, a lot of really cool metrics on that. Um, you know, we can't see your personal information, so don't worry about that. But, you know, I can't see that, you know, Bob specifically turned it off at that point, but I can see, you know, so many patrons watched it. And at this point they, they tapped out. Um, if you live in Massachusetts, you can get a Boston Public Library e-card. You don't even have to show up. You really don't have to do anything. And you can access Canopy right away with that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I'm very interested in their statistics. I would love BPL. to know. BPL, someone please reach out and tell us how many people have watched Ghost Ship. <laughs> yes. And if please, they finish it. Please, yes. And if they finish it, oh, my, that would actually be so interesting to know. I imagine most people would only watch the beginning. Yes. So there's a lot of people in this movie, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them I don't care about. So sorry <laughs> to these people. But uh, I, I never I never watched ER. I never watched The Good Wife. Yeah. I I don't know anything about Juliana Margulies other than mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because she gives me Nancy Kerrigan vibes, but she just feels very cold and off putting to me. <laughs> i get that i get that (laughs) like if she never played nancy kerrigan in a made for tv movie in like the 90s she should have (laughs) should have yeah i have no relationship with uh julia here so you know again yeah i didn't watch any of the shows that she was in i think this is probably the only thing i've ever seen her in yeah. I think so too. And yeah. I, and it made me the part of me was like, why is she in this movie? Um, yeah. And I guess it makes sense if they thought it was going to be more of a psychological thriller. Yeah. It, it makes more sense why some of these people may have signed up for it. That, that makes a lot of sense actually, because it, it yeah, some of the casting is very um, strange. It, it, 
the cast does not feel like a horror movie cast no and she, i don't think she is particularly good at screaming yeah no, she's not she's really bad at it yeah. yeah and so it didn't the the changes don't serve her talents whatever they may be well yeah yeah yes i agree and then we have gabriel byrne who is in hereditary so um oh. but i've always also found him just like kind of grossly unappealing yeah i mean i it's funny because i was thinking i feel like i know him from somewhere and yeah hereditary that makes sense um i can't say that i would know him from anything else um in this he, movie he, he doesn't particularly do much for me no i had to look him up because i'm like i know i've seen him in other things mm. i feel like he's always been like 50 even like yeah. 30 years ago when he was 30 right. you know he's 70 something now but yeah. he's in this really terrible movie called cool world with Ooh. it's a it's kind of a Roger Rabbit style live actors Ooh. meet cartoons. Those make me so uncomfortable. I love Roger <laughs> Rabbit. This movie <laughs> would make you, this movie makes me uncomfortable. It would definitely make you uncomfortable. It's very poorly done mm. and the cartoons are kind of sleazy. So it's really just icky. Ooh. It's one of Brad Pitt's first movies. Oh, and Kim Basinger is in it, and she gets turned into this slutty cartoon. No, she is a slutty cartoon. That's right. She's a slutty cartoon. Nice. And she, at a point, she turns into Kim Basinger because she wants to be real. Yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't like that. No, it's gross. Yeah. Yeah. And so and he's, he's like the, a main character. I think. I think he's the artist of the comic book. Oh. And then he gets sucked into his own comic book. Ooh, I don't I don't like it and they call them I think they call them doodles that's what the cartoons are called the doodles oh, the doodles <laughs> yeah I, and Kim Basinger is always like I don't want to be a doodle I don't... <laughs> and her oh, name's oh, Hollywood oh of course it is mm -hmm. of course it is and he has this like relationship with her while she's a cartoon, I think. Ooh. Anyway, it's creepy. I remember seeing this movie as a child. So Oh my um... god. Is it like marketed to kids? <laughs> I don't it's PG thirteen. Okay. I don't remember how it was marketed. Yeah. Um, I remember watching it a lot, but I watched everything a lot because I would just yeah. have HBO on all the time. Right, right. <laughs> um anyway, uh, moving on from that, we also have Emily Browning, who's who is a child in this movie, mm -hmm. she was in the series of unfortunate events movie. Yes, she's in Sucker Punch mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Do you know her from anything else? I would say those are actually probably the two main things. I always thought she was just like so beautiful, like she's mm -hmm. just such a pretty girl. Um, yeah, I think that's. I don't. I can't think of anything else I would know her from. I feel like she hasn't done a lot recently. She never quite took off for whatever. I reason. have like an image of her like playing like a like a girl in the sixties with like a little brown bob and like tight little cropped pants, and I can't remember why. Maybe I saw her recently. Did you ever see? There's this really uh, bad movie, The Host, which is based on the Stephanie Meyer book of the <gasps> same name. No. I kind of love that book. Yeah. <laughs> the movie's terrible, but the plot of it is it's it's invasion of the body snatchers, but narrated by a body snatcher. So the it's narrated by the alien that yeah. crawls into this girl and implants itself in her spine. Mm -hmm. And the girl's consciousness still exists and they bicker with each other sometimes. Yeah. But they end up taking I don't know. I Emily Browning pops up at the end oh. as like, I think she's the new body the alien has gone into or something. Oh. And the Saoirse Ronan plays the main character and she is allowed to be herself again. Interesting. Or something. Yeah. She pops up. She's not even credited. And, yeah. What the heck? Um, she's in this really good independent movie called Sleeping Beauty oh. from 2011 that is really tough to watch it's really oh, okay uh 
like a brutal movie. But she yeah. plays this young college student who takes this job as kind of like an escort. Um, oh, okay. But really weird shit happens. It's a very mm. bizarre movie, but I really like it. And yeah. She's, she's great in it. Huh. And she's Australian. She's Australian, really? Mm-hmm. I was going to say, because in this movie, in Go Ship, she has um, a, a British accent. And I thought that was pretty unnecessary. <laughs> it kind of, it was kind of very um, distracting to me that she had this kind of bizarre British accent. Yeah, they maybe and, thought that was less distracting than Australian. An Australian accent. That's very funny. I mean, I have to imagine this is probably her first movie role, or at least one of the first. And, you know, she probably hadn't worked on her English, her, her, I'm sorry, American accent. Um, but it, I don't know, the British accent really, really threw me for a loop. <laughs> Kids are creepier when they're British. That is true. That is an indisputable fact. Last and I don't know whether to say certainly least or certainly not least is Isaiah Washington. Mm -hmm. He is one of the crew members. I really, I really like him in this movie. Yeah. And it made me forget that he's kind of a hot mess to say the least. So he was on Grey's Anatomy. He was one of the original cast of Grey's Mm -hmm. Anatomy of which I have watched zero episodes. I was going to say, I've never seen a single Grey's Anatomy never seen it yeah but in 2007 he got into a physical altercation with patrick dempsey (gasps) and during this physical altercation with patrick dempsey called tr knight the (gasps) f-slur um and he had not yet come out at the time but he was gay um and katherine heigl (gasps) my queen went (laughs) out and told everyone this and like exposed it. And oh, then no. he, Isaiah Washington, was asked at the Emmy Awards about it. And he said, No, I did not call TR a F slur. And then he just said it though, like live at the Stop. Emmys. Stop. And so Catherine Heigl said, He needs to not speak in public, period. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so so he was fired from Grey's Anatomy later that year um he has gone on to uh very weirdly say some favorable things about the KKK um (gasps) because even though he's black when he was a child they were really nice to him the KKK families in this town oh Um, that's nice and he said that Trump has done more to help black people than Obama oh my god wow he I also never would have expected <laughs> he also called patrick dempsey a tyrant and considering i don't know how this physical altercation started like he might be a little right about that part and he says that they paid ellen pompeo five million dollars under the table to not talk bad about patrick dempsey in public wow i mean <laughs> i was kind of with him like when you said that he got into a physical altercation with patrick dempsey because <laughs> I I understand wanting to punch that man. Like he has a very punchable <laughs> face. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I I was I was Team Isaiah up until you know the F slur. To his credit, Matt Damon was still saying the F slur up until 2021. So that is so true. That is so true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> what I like to see. So I was I was trying to remember the details of this because whenever. This sticks with me um, when because I just remember reading these news stories. Yeah. And any celebrity who uses homophobic slurs like is on my shit list forever. Right. And what I was really happy to see, though, on the Grey's Anatomy subreddit, it seems like every six months, I don't know, someone's like, what happened to Isaiah Washington? And they rehash oh, yeah, this. Yeah. But at least once or twice in a post, someone will call Katherine Heigl queen or goddess. <gasps> and I'm just like, yes, she needs like when... When will Katherine Heigl come back? <laughs> seriously. Seriously. I know. I love her. I never, like, you know, the vitriol around her being hard to work with. It was absolutely just because she was an opinionated woman. Let's talk about the gothic elements of this movie. All right. So all gothic films have four elements. A girl, a guy, a house, and a haunt. 
Unfortunately, Katherine Heigl, not our girl in this. <laughs> yeah. We have a whole crew of girls in a sense. Yeah. It's funny. I kind of forgot what movie we were talking about for a minute there. Because like, <laughs> we had cut off topic about Katherine Heigl. And I literally, when you said the thing about a girl, I went, I don't even know how to answer this. <laughs> like, it's like, I forget. Yeah. Yeah. A whole, a whole, a whole gaggle of girls. I think I do think even though I liked watching this movie, I also mm-hmm. think it is eminently forgettable. Yes, it, it it really is. It it truly is. And I'm someone, quick side note, who loves the concept of ghost ships. Like it's a real mm-hmm. thing. And there's over 200 ghost ships right now floating around in the ocean. Um, like on top of the ocean? Like, yeah, floating around. <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah. What happens a lot is a ship will be getting tugged by a, you know, a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, like a smaller boat, a pole boat. What is, there's like a term for it. It doesn't matter. Tugboat. Tugboat. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, you know, there'll be no one on the main ship and the, you know, bond will break and they just, there's no way to get it. And they just kind of let it float away. So there's over 200 of them estimated. There could be more just floating around in the ocean fascinating so this is like a real career that people do where they go around and they find boats because it is true like finders keepers and they right because international yeah maritime law right so i love the concept i love this group of you know pirates you know like going out and getting their fortune it's it's Mm -hmm. adorable I love them. They, so they get lured there. So just to jump ahead to the guy real quick. Yeah. So they get lured there by this guy named Ferryman mm-hmm. who says he's found this mythical lost ship and it has a ton of riches on it. Right. Yes. Oh, and I forgot to talk about him. Desmond, he's played by Desmond Harrington, mm. who I have such a crush on. Um <laughs> I just think he's so attractive. He yeah. was on the Dexter TV show. Oh. In the in the mid 2000s and I just loved him on that. Who who was he on that? I did watch that a little bit. He comes in I think the 3rd season. The okay. first couple seasons there's a cop who's mm-hmm. on Dexter's ass and right. he gets killed in the second or third season and yeah. then and then Desmond Harrington plays the new cop that comes in. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I didn't get to that point. Uh, I just I just think he's so handsome. So I was happy yeah. to see him in this movie. But he's a good gothic guy in the sense that he is trying to manipulate these people for his own personal benefit. He really is. Yeah, he's, you know, and he's very, I personally, I think the plot twist is pretty easy to see coming that he's, you know, at least not a good guy. I mean, his name is literally Ferryman. Which, which I didn't like, get until I was typing up my notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, I can't remember what what piece of media it was that I was watching, but like, you know, someone said about how they could like see the twist about Darth Vader a mile away because his name is literally Father in German. And that's how I feel about Ferryman. Yeah. Oh my gosh, but... <laughs> I didn't know that either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but also like, you know, it's, it's very suspicious from the beginning you know he he goes up to this random table of pirates and he's like i i don't even remember how he says like he found the boat but it's like if you found the boat i, I don't know it's very bizarre um, it's like a weather watcher or something oh, or like yeah. a meteorologist or something that's right thing. yeah he has some sort of weird backstory um but yeah he's a great guy and you know jumping ahead like to sort of the whole plot of the movie like I feel like his story at the end is like what really carries the movie at that point because it gets a little meh. But um, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's also pretty much the haunt, sort of. He yeah. he's been sent to claim souls, right? Yeah. I don't remember why. Are they just going to hell for? The I think fun they're of just it, going or? to hell yeah yeah I think, I think it's just hell um you know and it's just very convenient that you know he got really close with the amount of people who were on the cruise ship but he needs 
you know, I think I think it's implied that you know there's other crews that go to the ship, but it just so happens that the last crew of like six people are the ones who like really stick it to him. Um, right. <laughs> very convenient, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's his 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 motivation is I think he just needs souls. He needs souls. Yeah, and the the ghosts on the there are ghosts on the mm-hmm. ghost ship. Um. And I have to do a callback to our 13 ghosts. If if we remember, um, there was a letterbox reviewer, single white mm-hmm. familian, who said about 13 ghosts, also directed by Steve Beck, that there's a sexy titty ghost in this, and that's how you know it's good. <laughs> yes. So she has another review for Ghost Ship. Great. Which also has a sexy titty ghost in it. <laughs> And she says, in my factual opinion, every straight man would fuck a sexy titty ghost and you can't convince me otherwise. Oh, a hundred percent. Like a thousand percent. <laughs> yes. Especially this one. This one is very sexy. She is sexy because she's not covered in scars and yeah. just like literally looks like a corpse. Like, so yeah. she is this hot opera singer uh-huh. who lures the Isaiah Washington character to his death yep. by taking her sexy titties out and luring him into an elevator shaft. (laughs) (laughs) Because of course. Uh... He, when they show up, they show up on the ship. The ship has been sunk for what, 50 years or something. It's been sunk for a while. Yeah. So we know everybody who was on this ship died. Mm -hmm. And there's a piano with the photo on it of the opera singer. And he looks at it and says, nice tits. Of course. Yeah. I mean, that's the first thing you notice about every opera singer. (laughs) He's just saying it out loud. He has a problem with saying the quiet thoughts out loud. Yes. His whole character (laughs) is that he's supposed to be getting married. But he seems to be so horny that he would fuck this sexy titty ghost. And he knows it's not real. Like he literally he knows says she's a that ghost. Line. Yeah. Oh, it's very funny. This movie reminded me a bit of Event Horizon. Have you ever okay. seen that? I don't think so. They're on a spaceship and they mm. go crazy. I'm wondering. So Event Horizon is gross, but it, I think it is more psychological than this one. So oh, I okay. wonder if the screenwriter was trying to do like Event Horizon at sea. Oh. But Kathleen Quinlan's character dies in almost exactly the same way as Isaiah Washington, except instead of a sexy titty ghost, it's the ghost of her dead son. And she follows him and he lures her down an elevator shaft and she dies. Okay. Wow. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just so blinded by grief or sexy titty ghost that, yeah. (laughs) one in the same really yes <laughs> they're both uh longing for yes. something yeah <laughs> so our house is a ship yeah a ghost it's a, ship it's a fun it's a fun a fun setting for us i don't think we've ever done a ship there aren't enough ships and that was something that ebert really liked was the ship yeah yeah i love I was actually really disappointed that there wasn't more <laughs> nautical scares. Like, mm. like, like there's, I think only one scene where you see like sort of a ghost underwater, like being creepy. I wish mm. that there was more of that, like, I don't know, like, like seaside spooks. Like I just wanted some more, I don't know, like do something in like a lifeboat. I, I just love because to me the ocean is already horrifying like even being on a cruise ship I I will never do a cruise in my life I did a cruise once when I was very young and the only thing I remember is that I got seasick I had a special little credit card kind of thing that my mom preloaded with money so that I, I could feed myself and leave her alone for the entire week and I went to the candy counter every single day and I would get chocolate tr- covered strawberries and I would just eat the chocolate off of them. I don't know why I didn't just get <laughs> chocolate. And it was so bad that at the end of the, like the last day on the cruise ship, my mom decided she wanted to like go around and get like, you know, souvenirs for everyone. And the women at the candy counter were like, Oh, hi 
hi little miss amanda like how are you today <laughs> like they were like do you want your chocolate covered strawberries <laughs> so there's that <laughs> <laughs> and also when we were in the room there was like four channels and but every single channel would play the same thing over and over again so kind of like your hbo dilemma yeah. and one of and only one of them was suitable for children and it was they played i don't even remember what movie it was and i've tried googling it if anyone is listening and knows what i'm talking about please send us like a message on instagram mm. it was a movie I thought it was the Tooth Fairy movie that The Rock was in. I thought it was that for a couple of years. But that movie came out way later than I would have seen it on this. And I thought it was that because I definitely remember there was a guy who was like dressed up as a Tooth Fairy, like a man, like a like a fairy. And he said, um, can you smell what the Tooth Fairy is cooking? So he said the rock line but as the tooth fairy and that's it's, all it, i remember is it the pacifier with vin diesel i don't think so i used to I get think, those two movies confused a lot yeah no i think it would be even older than those two i was probably okay. about eight or nine and oh so that so that actually would have been around the time of uh ghost ship's release so okay um, good thing i didn't see this movie in theaters um but yeah, so like early 2000s, but it might have been an older movie. I don't remember. Please let me you know. But anyways, with all I of that I hope we can said, solve this mystery, yeah. I really, really do too. With all of that said, I will never do another cruise ship again. I don't understand the point of them. They're already scary to me. So I honestly would probably have a better time on an abandoned one with ghosts, if I'm being honest. I think I would too. I've never yeah. done one and I do yeah. want to do one just to have the experience. Yeah. I am afraid of getting seasick because I do get very motion sick. Mm, yeah. If, and I don't want to be trapped. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, like I was, I've talked about it where I just like, I feel like you would get so bored on them. And, but now they have these like mega huge giant cities on the water that have like different neighborhoods and then at that point i'm like overwhelmed i mm -hmm. i won't i won't do one anyways but it makes for a great horror movie setting i do really like it i do too and i i do agree with what you said though they it kind of turns into just like almost like they're in a hotel like they yeah. don't use the nautical theme to their advantage yeah yeah and i don't even think there's really like a lot of good shots of them like up on deck or anything like that it does it starts to feel very much just like a hotel they shot most of it on a sound stage mm. they did build some miniatures for some of the exterior shots so there really mm. wasn't like a deck even for them to be on mm. yeah um, they were inspired so the ship is called the antonia grazia Mm -hmm. And it's based on a real ship called the Andrea Doria that sank in 1956. Ooh. And many people plumbed its, you know, depths for the last right. half century. It's basically mm. disintegrated under the water at this point. Yeah. But one of the survivors of the Andrea Doria, so not many people died. The Andrea Doria was sinking and they were able to get most of the people off. But one of the survivors wrote Elvis. There's always an Elvis connection. Wrote Jailhouse Rock. Really? Yeah. If he had sank, wow. we never would have had Jailhouse Rock. Wow. That would have been such a tragedy for society. Mm -hmm. He had already written Hound Dog. For, oh. Um, oh, shit. I'm I've turned into Elvis. I can't remember the name of the woman who originally oh, sang no. um... Hound Dog. Big Mama Thornton. Naha, yes. So he had written Hound Dog and Big Mama Thornton had recorded it. Mm -hmm. But while he was on this sinking ship, Elvis recorded it. And so by the time he got rescued from this boat, it was a huge hit. That's so funny. <laughs> he didn't even know who Elvis was. Oh my God. Wow. What a what a, what a weekend. You survived the sinking <laughs> ship. <laughs> right and that's and not he... even the most exciting thing to have happened to you <laughs> seriously <laughs> wow what a what a time for that guy yeah oh. 
So how gothic do you think this movie is? Is it so gothic, goth-ish, or no gothic? It's funny because I definitely went into this at the beginning of us recording, and I think we've done this a few times now, where I really didn't think it was gothic at all. But, I mean, maybe I would throw it like a goth-ish. Like a very small-ish. And I think it is mostly because of the guy and a little bit of the house i mean and it it has ghosts i mean it has like literal spooky little girl ghosts with like bows in her hair like that's very gothic (laughs) and she's british and she's british and she she just wants to help yeah i agree i think it's gothish yeah the atmosphere is very gothic we don't have a strong protagonist Mm. they're different i think than the typical gothic girl because in a way they're being punished for their greed and the gothic girl gen genuine generally is motivated by love or some more pure desire than just wanting riches right right yeah yeah i think you know (laughs) it's also really hard when we're talking about these movies like from the early 2000s like these horror movies saying that they're gothic because like i think especially the soundtrack really takes me out of it yeah we've got like in the middle of a scene yeah exactly hit the electric guitar my favorite part of this movie is probably the ending when you know spoilers um she gets saved the main character you know she's sitting in the ambulance and then she thinks that she's killed ferryman and then you see him walk onto another ship with you know boxes or whatever but it's so funny because this song starts playing and it it sounds like the that opening theme song for like csi it's like what (laughs) (laughs) yes it's very very funny to me csi by way of slipknot yeah (laughs) yeah it's like they start playing like freak on a leash or something (laughs) yes They must have tried to license that at oh, least. That would would have been a good one. Yeah. But it's, I think, you know, elements of these movies, you know, especially like this movie, 13 Ghosts, it just takes you out of it and it makes you feel like it's not gothic. Um, but it's still, you know, you see the parts of it that are in, probably inspired by classic horror movies. And I appreciate that. I agree. I, I think even the sexy titty ghost has an element of the gothic <laughs> to it. You know, the ghost yeah. being somewhat alluring. It's scary, yes. but also, ooh, I, you know, I'm going to go towards it. That type of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely. a, I mean, th- that goes back to the shining. There's sexy titty yeah. ghosts in the shining. That's so right. She's the OG sexy titty ghost. Yeah. Should we just like stop talking about gothic movies entirely and strictly focus on movies with sexy titty ghosts? That'll be our new podcast name, Sexy, yeah. Sexy Titty Ghost. I don't know if I we're allowed to have that as a podcast name, but <laughs> I'll just make the moon in our logo just a one big boob. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I can't wait yeah. to see what other Sexy Titty Ghosts we find. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's like, where's Waldo? <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to look that hard, though, because they're always big. Like, they're always right out there. That is true. You don't see some, like, you know, (laughs) flat-chested sexy titty ghosts. Mm -hmm. I love my flat-chested ladies, but I'm sorry. You're not being representative. Represented in the sexy titty ghost community. I I was also watching, uh, don't judge me, fear.com. Oh, I actually have that on DVD to watch, so I do not judge you. It's pretty terrible right and there there aren't sexy titty ghosts in it but there are sexy titty corpses Ooh, that's a good one too all the women who are brutally murdered are topless of course of course yeah and you the, gotta... the men when they're on the autopsy table for some reason have the sheets like pulled up to their chins <laughs> yes. but the women being autopsied like yeah. the sheet barely covers like their their pubic bone like of they're course. just out there yeah yeah well you see with women autopsies you got to cut through a lot more 
you know, fat because of the titties. So well, they have the the stitches go right around the boobs. Yeah. So it's oh, like they, they they hinge open like like French doors, you know, to yes. do the to do the and then they put them back like right right where they belong. Of course, of course, yes, yeah. where they belong. <laughs> so look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have at least one memorable scene to talk about. I imagine we both chose the same memorable scene, which is this movie's opening scene. Yes. And I, I don't know how I've lived this long and did not know about the opening scene of ghost ship. Really? Yeah. That's so funny. I feel like I I see it every time. Like if you ever, if you ever do like any mindless scrolling on like a TikTok and Instagram, anything like I feel like the scene comes up at some point for I me at least it. I was so shocked and loved it I was yeah. like I am so into this movie do you want to talk about the scene yeah I mean so basically I mean I think a lot of people do know what it is it's a you know a bunch of people are out on the uh you know cabana deck or whatever it's called the the poop deck and they're <laughs> And they're dancing to this opera singer. She's being all sexy, you know, slinky red dress, having a great time. There's all of these string lights um, sort of hanging around. And then I think you see someone like sort of cranking. I think it might be the string lights. I don't know what exactly. Maybe it's something shippy. Maybe it's nautical. Yeah. I think yeah. it might be something nautical. Um, it's some so sort of like, wire yeah they're like tightening it tightening it and then i think you see them cut it so Mm -hmm. it goes you know the tension makes it spring it goes through all of the people it bisects them um and then i think the horrifying part well the first horrifying part is the second where they realize they've been cut and then genuinely like upsetting to me like physically made me sort of ill is you get this bird's eye shot of the floor and there's just all of these cut in half bodies and some of them are still like writhing in pain. Really hard for me to watch. Like I, I have no words for like the, the pit I feel in my stomach right now, just talking about it. It's so icky. And Emily Browning is in the middle of it and she doesn't get bisected you know i think it's implied because she's too short but like the guy she's dancing with like gets bisected like inches below her head so i don't understand but you know whatever it's fine <laughs> she's fine and then it basically escalates into you know it's funny because when i was re-watching it for the podcast i was like that can't be everyone on the boat like that would be way too convenient but it does show that afterwards sort of chaos ensues and they gather up all the other people and kill them yeah it's like a i i couldn't quite figure out what was happening there's some sort of heist some yeah. sort of legal activity on the boat it's a right. little more convoluted than it needs to be yeah but that opening oh it's so gross there were i feel like there were a lot of people being cut into pieces with mm. cg in the early 2000s because the <laughs> The attorney from 13 Ghosts gets cut up and down. And then in the Resident Evil movie, Mm. there is like a very video gamey, even though not it's not a Resident Evil game. It's like they got it from a different game entirely. But there's like a laser hallway where they have to like avoid these lasers and the guy gets cut into these little cubes. Yes. Um, So again, I feel like somebody there somebody created this algorithm, this program. To CG cut people in half and go ship, they were able to get it on a budget and do they this. They loved it. They this loved scene. it but so it's, much. It's really effective. Uh, the effects are really good for the time, I think. Yeah. And there's yeah. some good, yeah, there's a, the guy who's like cut in half and his like innards are dangling out Ooh, and yeah. his legs are like two feet away and yeah, he's yeah. still moving. He's oh. like trying to like, there's like a woman who's trying to get her legs like, it is yeah. icky. It's icky. Um, but yeah, very effective. It's so good. I wish the rest of the movie was like that because yeah. it's kind of all downhill from there. But if you if you haven't seen Ghost Ship, definitely watch the beginning yeah. on Canopy and then we can see the drop off when we finally yes. get into the back end. Please do. Please do. I was surprised. I feel like the rest of the movie wasn't 
as gory. I mean, there's some gory parts, but that was like, you know, maybe maybe that's all they could get away with. They were like they used their both budget wise and rating wise, maybe. Yeah. 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 They just put it all in that. And you know what? Good for them. It was it was worth it. It's worth it. That's the only reason I think people still remember Ghost Ship. Yeah, I agree. Well, what else have you been watching, Amanda? Well, so <laughs> it's funny because so last night I went to go see if if I was a good movie lover, I would talk about how last night I went to go see um, Wildcat and I got to see Ethan Hawke do a Q&A afterwards. Um, but I do not want to talk about that because I want to talk about a really horrible Nicolas Cage movie I watched on Tubi. Ooh. Um, yeah and it's 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 just plain bad like it's not so bad it's good but it is so bad that I could not stop thinking about it um because I just could not believe that this movie got made um it's called pay the ghost it came out in 2015 have you heard of this movie I've never heard of this me neither I had it had never crossed my radar I guess I learned this after the fact I guess there was a point where Nicolas Cage was pumping out a lot of these really bad movies because he owed a lot of money to the RERS. Yes. So like, yeah, a lot of people were making the joke on Letterboxd like it was it should have been called Pay the Cage because it was just like a movie he did for a paycheck. Um, but the reason I want to talk about this movie is because I need to talk about there is so the whole plot of the movie is Nicolas Cage is this suave professor, English professor who has a son um who goes missing and then you know there's a supernatural element to it and so he's looking for his son whatever um (laughs) so the movie starts off i just i like need to paint the scene for you the movie starts off with nicholas cage as this english professor he works in this old like it looks like a harvard or something like that an old building he you know leaves he goes to on this busy road he's trying to catch a cab he can't catch a cab he goes home to his beautiful brownstone it's halloween he takes his son to this carnival but it's not even like a carnival like we might know it's a carnival sort of in the middle like in this alley and it's all like crowded and you know there's just like a lot of street vendors so like as i'm talking about it like what city are you imagining like where are you imagining this Oh, God, I couldn't even put it in a place. Since you said Harvard, I would just picture some New England yeah, city. Yeah, like New yeah. England, Boston. Well, the, the, that's where the Ivy Leagues, I feel like, right. are in New yeah. England. Yeah, right. Like very old. So the kid goes missing at this carnival and a cop shows up and he very clearly and loudly says, we'll have every cop in Arizona looking for your son. <laughs> and i got so distracted i was like there's no way there's no way this is supposed (laughs) to be arizona so like i spent the next 20 minutes like not even paying attention to this movie i was just looking for any signs that this could be arizona you can look at my google search history i searched arizona brownstones because i was like is there a place oh yeah brownstones yeah with brownstones like i what what i'm like so confused the whole time the next 20 minutes i have no idea and then Nick Cage again is on a city street and I see a cop car and it says NYPD. So I'm like, it has to be New York. So I go and I re- rewind the movie 20 minutes and I check and the cop definitely said, we will have every officer in Arizona looking for your son. So what I imagine happened is his line was supposed to be something along the lines of, we'll have every cop from here to Arizona looking for your son and they just never fixed it (gasps) that's a good that's a good catch i literally could not stop thinking about it for the next there's like where are the cactuses where are they and then there's like a really intense fight scene with nick cage and the ghost there's some cool like (laughs) in the ghost in the ghost there's some cool like imagery in this movie and I don't think, of course, like all of the exposition comes from a 
a blind homeless man with white man dreadlocks. Um, so, you know, there's some interesting parts of the movie. I don't know if I recommend watching it, but like also I kind of want people to watch it just so that I know I'm not crazy and this wasn't just a fever dream that I dreamt up because that's what I'm starting to think it was. Yeah, this is wild. I've never yeah. heard of this movie. Never. It's directed like, oh. by... Oh, go on. I was going to say, like, I was like, I was so excited when I saw it on Tubi. I was like, ooh, maybe this will be some, like, obscure, like, you know, cult classic. It's not. <laughs> there were... My favorite Nicolas Cage rumor was that his tomb that he had built in New mm-hmm. Orleans was mm-hmm. filled with money that he was hiding from the IRS. I could see him do that. Mm-hmm. yeah it was like an obelisk yeah. that he had built in one of the <gasps> historic cemeteries and everybody in new orleans fucking hated that he did that yeah. and i think they changed the zoning laws or something after that uh-huh. to prevent people from doing it again yeah oh oh nick the director of this movie is a german man named uli <laughs> adel he directed last exit to brooklyn which i was watching on canopy because last exit to brooklyn is based on a novel And the author of the novel also wrote Requiem for a Dream. Oh, okay. And it takes place in 1950s Brooklyn. And there's like a labor strike. Mm. Jennifer Jason Leigh plays a hooker. There's a secretly gay character. Yeah. Um, Who else? Who popped? Someone popped up in that movie. And I was like, that's so-and-so. Yeah. Who is it? Oh, it's Stephen Baldwin is in it. Oh, (laughs) Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell <gasps> pops up. Very young. Ooh. Um, Ricky Lake is in it. Ooh. And Alexis Arquette plays a trans character. Okay. So that he's movie not is from like 1989. A, yeah, he's not like a nobody director. Like he he apparently has a career. Or had, yeah. Or had, yeah. It's it's a very bizarre movie. And I think pay the ghost came out after insidious and it's like very similar vibes so i think they were just trying to piggyback off of that okay the the vibes it's not a good movie but like i i need people to watch it i'm so glad you've told me about it i love a to some my to be trash yeah yeah it is good to throw on in the background i think i will do so there's like a very like so the ghost takes kids obviously that's like part of the you know concept but she takes three kids every year and it just so happens that the year that nick cage goes to you know save these kids it's a little white kid it's a little asian girl and it's a little hispanic kid who can barely speak english and i was like oh what a cute little diverse group i love that it's like like sesame street it's so nice (laughs) (laughs) she's making sure it's equal yeah exactly exactly mm-hmm. she, she's she's partaking in affirmative action yeah the the, the, the ghost has a <laughs> dei clause for her kidnapping <laughs> <laughs> very progressive uh, yeah she is she is <laughs> <laughs> anyways what have you been up to yeah, so I watched Love Lies Bleeding, which is oh. the new Kristen Stewart movie. Mm-hmm. It's directed by Rose Glass, who did Saint Maud. Did you ever see Saint Maud? Oh, I did. See- I love Saint Maud. Yeah, I, I liked that, that one as well. So this one's very different, and it takes place. I almost said it does take place in Arizona. It takes place in New Mexico, oh. and it is the desert. Yeah. Um and. <laughs> Kristen Stewart works it's I think it's the 80s Kristen Mm. Stewart works in this sweaty little gym it just looks like one little box with machines (laughs) in it yeah and everybody's sweaty and and you know working out yep and she makes eyes with this sexy female bodybuilder that comes Mm -hmm. in one day and falls in love with her so they start having a steamy love affair Mm -hmm. And the bodybuilder is a hitchhiker who has ended up there from, I forget where she came from, but far away. She's hitching her way to Las Vegas because she wants to win a bodybuilding tournament. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So to help her win, Kristen Stewart starts passing her steroids because everybody's <gasps> doing steroids in the gym. Yeah. So she gives her these steroids and she, what she doesn't know yet is that the bodybuilder got a job when she hitchhiked into town working working at a restaurant that's also at a shooting range. Ooh, so fun. It's really cool because she'll be serving and you just hear gunshots in the background and yeah. it's totally normal. The guy who runs the shooting range is played by Ed Harris, who I adore and yeah. is so gross in this movie. He's so disgusting. He's bald on top and has uh -huh. the like fringe of hair, but the hair Ooh. is like a foot long. Ooh. it's so disgusting yucky um, i love it he's so gross so he doesn't just run this shooting range he also deals illicit firearms over the border mm. and is kind of a criminal kingpin in new mexico he's also Kristen stewart's dad <gasps> so there's this Ooh. tension there yeah. and so his employee is his son-in-law played by dave franco Oh, okay. And Dave Franco is married to Jenna Malone, who I also oh, adore. Oh, I love Jenna Malone. I don't know why no one has cast Jenna Malone and Kristen Stewart as sisters before this. Like, they oh, look like they could be yeah. related. Like, there's it's such good casting. Yeah. So she's she's Kristen Stewart's sister. Dave Franco beats the shit out of her Um at, quite frequently and yeah. Kristen it pisses Kristen Stewart off so much she's like she's always like oh I wish I could just kill him so in a like spurt of roid rage the female bodybuilder murders him <gasps> and that's like the first 30 minutes and then like yeah. things kind of spiral out of control from there yeah. um really good movie I really liked it very pulpy very sweaty Ooh. it feels like even though it's set in the 80s like it feels like a 70s movie it's oh got a vibe to yeah. it yeah the ending makes some really bizarre choices that i okay. don't want to spoil and yeah. don't, don't even know how to explain but i i really liked it overall it's a great great movie oh. i don't think it's on any sort of free streaming service yet yeah. i saw it in an actual movie theater yeah yeah that's what i wanted to watch it it looked very intriguing to me it kind of gave like roadhouse vibes it kind of does the, the i don't the female bodybuilder she is a relative newcomer i think mm. the actress who plays her her name yeah. is katie o'brien oh. she is gonna be in twisters oh boy i gotta see my favorite person in the world glenn powell She's going to be in Twisters and she is, I mean, she's jacked as all fuck. Like yeah. she is so jacked um, and she's great. She's so good Ooh. in this movie too. So great performances all around. All right. I'll definitely have to check that out. Highly recommend. Well, that does it for us today. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Ghosties, for listening to us break down ghost ship please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts rate and review us on apple podcasts or spotify and please share us with a friend especially one who might know a movie that's not the tooth fairy but uh <laughs> references the rock and the tooth fairy in the same yes. line from like or late 90s early 2000s yeah definitely share us point. with that friend yeah please um so <laughs> in, <laughs> until next time stay ghosty boo bye bye, bye.